Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Dr. Ramakrishna. I'm the Chief of uh, Neurologic Surgery here at Brooklyn Methodist Hospital, and uh, we're part of the big network with NYP and Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to host the second uh, in our series of brain and spine health webinars. We had our first uh, a few weeks ago uh, where uh, I discussed the management of brain tumors. Um, and we're continuing on uh, by discussing uh, spine care and how minimally invasive spine is really the future uh, and how we're bringing all of that to Brooklyn. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, just briefly, if you go to this next slide, Lewis, um, we have a pretty massive team that we've developed here at Brooklyn Methodist in conjunction with, with Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, some of those members are pictured there. Uh, our team really represents the gamut of neurosurgery and neuroscience uh, between neurosurgery, neurology, rehabilitation medicine, oncology, radiation oncology, uh, pain management, etc. We have our beautiful spine center at the Barclays uh, facility, uh, which provides comprehensive, comprehensive spine care uh, to our patients, where patients can get one-stop shopping with neurosurgery, neurology, physiatry, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's a really great resource for patients. Um, and with that, um, if you go to the next slide, Lewis, I'd love to introduce uh, Dr. Chang. He is our newest addition to the Wild Cornell Medicine Neurosurgery faculty. Um, he comes previously from uh, the DC Baltimore area prior to joining us and actually was a fellow at minimally invasive spine surgery at Wild Cornell Medicine some time ago. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have him uh, join our team. Um, he has uh, hit the ground running uh, here in Brooklyn and done an amazing job uh, in terms of uh, evangelizing minim minimally invasive spine care. And uh, we're really fortunate to have him. So with that, I'll turn it over to him and he'll go through the uh, amazing advances in uh, MIS spine care. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramakrishna, for that introduction. Um, so I uh, want to... Um, I see that other people are coming in, so I'm just admitting them. Um, I don't know if Roseanne, you have the um, the option from your side to admit the the um, participants as they come in, but uh, I might uh, lose track of them as I'm doing my talk. Don't don't worry about that. We're taking care of that. Oh, okay, great, great. Um, uh, one one thing I would like to add um, is that uh, I everybody's muted. Um, but uh, feel free, if you have any questions uh, during the talk, um, and definitely at the end, go ahead and uh, type it into the uh, chat function. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Ramakrishna could read the uh, question out loud, um, and then I'll uh, do my best to answer it. Um, in any case, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming on this uh, soggy afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, be asked to, uh, to give this talk. Um, as Dr. Ramakrishna said, my focus is uh, primarily spine surgery, and in particular, uh, minimally invasive uh, spine surgery. And um, I I'm very excited to talk about minimally invasive spine surgery, and, and sometimes I'll refer to MIS uh, just for short. Um, I'm really excited to talk about that because of the way that it's changed my practice over the years um, and the degree uh, that I've seen to change the lives of my patients. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Uh, but uh, I, I did my residency uh, at University of Maryland between uh, 2004 and 2011. Um, and during that time, MIS uh, techniques and spine surgery was really at its infancy. Uh, most of my attendings were uh, trained uh, using traditional open techniques, and uh, even the younger uh, attendings that uh, came through during my residency uh, didn't really have much exposure uh, to MIS techniques that were coming or coming about during that time. Um, I had interest in MIS during residency, but really there, there wasn't uh, any opportunity to learn that uh, from anybody uh, back then. So. It wasn't until after uh, my residency that um, I started to uh, pick it up on my own 
um, by attending courses, uh, talking to other surgeons, uh, reading papers, and, uh, and ultimately cum uh, culminated with uh, doing a, uh, a fellowship with uh, Dr. Roger Hartle here at uh, Weill Cornell, who is uh, internationally known for uh, MIS surgery and spine. So what I'd like to do um, this afternoon is, is um, give you a flavor of what uh, MIS spine surgery is, uh, where we are with its uh, uh, technique and technology, um, what we can accomplish with MIS surgery, uh, why I like it so much, and uh, what's on the horizon. Um, now, I put this little disclaimer there. I really don't have anything too graphic uh, in there. Uh, you know, if you watch, uh, if you watch uh, HBO or any of those uh, uh, streaming videos, uh, I don't think any of these uh, pictures are going to bother you. I just don't want to shock anybody. Uh, there will be some intraoperative uh, photos that come along. Uh, but one of my early exposures to MIS surgery was, uh, was actually not in the operating room, but, uh, but on a flight. And I'm sure many of you uh, may remember flipping through the in-flight magazine and coming across this beautiful, glossy um, advertisement and picture of, uh, of uh, this young lady uh, stretching, uh, in an uninhibited way with just a little Band-Aid on her lower back. Uh, and it was an advertisement for uh, a now defunct uh, pain management group and uh, spine surgery group that, uh, that basically uh, formed out of uh, Florida. And, um, and then a couple of years ago, it, it, uh, uh, it went under. Uh, but that kind of uh, message, that kind of uh, uh, marketing was an incredible um, way to, to uh, get patients' attention and uh, to get them to uh, go to them for, for treatments. Um, and uh, many patients uh, over the years, um, when they were still around, um, came to see me in the office and, and um, for surgical consultations. And, and after I explained what I, what I could do for them, uh, Many of them would ask me, uh, do, can I do it with laser or can, I, can they do laser surgery? Uh, but that's not really what um, MIS surgery is. Um, and uh, uh, by the way, uh, I, I also saw a fair share of patients that came to me um, after they had um, their, their treatments uh, at uh, these facilities. Um, and uh, I, I would have their um, operative report or procedural report. And really what it described were just traditional pain management uh, techniques and treatments and, and surgeries. And albeit the surgeries were uh, the smaller type of surgeries, maybe uh, for anatomy or uh, just a simple decompression. Um, but uh, they, you know, they, none of their procedures were um, Done with lasers, and uh, they could have been done at any credible practice. Uh, but you know, I'll give it to them. They really knew how to market their uh, their business uh, and to bring in a lot of patients. Um, but even without lasers and and uh, using band aids post op, um, I discovered er early on uh, when I was um, doing these surgeries that the true MIS surgery does result in smaller incisions and less prominent scars. Um, this is one of my uh, early cases uh, almost a dec decade ago, um, and it was a, a lumbar fusion that I did. And uh, usually lumbar fusion entails a very long uh, incision in, in, the, in the midline over here. Uh, but I was able to uh, do this through uh, two uh, uh, paramedian incisions uh, about uh, two inches long on either side, maybe a little bit less. Um, I was so thrilled with the result. Uh, I, I had to take a picture of this. And, uh, uh, and you know, ever since, uh, this has just been my passion. Um, so how do we define uh, MIS spine surgery? Um, well, you know, there are different uh, professional societies or entities that have pretty technical definitions, and they all very a uh, little bit uh, uh, differently uh, in slight ways, but um, the way I think of it is, is this. Uh, th this is my, these are my own words, but I, I, I think it's a, a philosophical approach 
to spine surgery that uses uh, techniques, uh, skills, and, and technologies to, um, to achieve the same goals as traditional open surgery while avoiding uh, unnecessarily removing anatomical structures uh, and with the least amount of uh, surrounding tissue disruption. Um, so uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, when, when, I, when I hear um, the patient coming to me or, or someone saying uh, uh, surgeon XYZ advertise or tell their patients that uh, they're a uh, MIS spine surgeon because they do microdiscectomies, uh, whereby they do it through um, a, a tube, uh, but that's the extent of their MIS technique. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to call them a true MIS spine surgeon. I, I think a true MIS spine surgeon um, is one that is equipped with, um, with a broad base of knowledge and skills and, and technologies uh, to allow them to use any number of MIS te uh, techniques and approaches for spine surgery. Um, and as we'll see later, not, not all spine surgeries are amenable to MIS just yet. But uh, the way I see spine pathology, the way I approach uh, problems uh, in the spine uh, is how can I do this with uh, MIS techniques or in combination or a hybrid of MIS and traditional open techniques um, before resorting to the solely traditional uh, open method. And uh, wh why do I feel so strongly uh, in MIS for my patients? Uh, well, uh, what I've learned over the years is um, uh, what I've seen uh, basically in, in medical literature. And uh, um, the, the column on the left, uh, you have uh, patient benefits, uh, which uh, as you saw from uh, the pre couple of slides before, it's smaller incisions. Uh, which translates to uh, better, cos better cosmetic results. Uh, but because of the whole goal of uh, MIS surgery is to do it through uh, smaller incisions and smaller um, dissection, uh, usually we'll have uh, less blood loss, way less blood loss than I found uh, in, my, in my experience. Um, and because the incisions are smaller, um, the, there's uh, going to be uh, lower infection rates. Um, and also the, the way that it's, um, the approaches to the spine uh, also matters with the infection rate. Um, generally, we do this through muscle splitting techniques and not, uh, uh, not dissecting muscle off or stripping muscle off of bone. Uh, sometimes that could devascularize that area. Um, making it harder to clear uh, potential infections. Um, less post-op pain uh, is, is something that, uh, that I see. And that's a combination of both uh, having smaller incision, uh, but also, um, as I was just alluding to, uh, the, um, uh, the traditional open method, you're, um, a lot of times you're stripping the muscle off of the, uh, off of the bone, off of the spine, and you're putting retractors, deep retractors in to hold the muscle apart. Uh, well, there are many studies that have shown that, um, that prolonged muscle retraction can lead to uh, muscle ischemia, and that translates to um, uh, greater post-op pain uh, and possibly muscle atrophy uh, later on. Um, shorter hospital stay, um, it wasn't uncommon for me uh, when I was doing traditional open surgery to have patients uh, in the hospital for uh, days, several days, uh, with a wound train, with uh, maybe a PCA pump, um, and uh, maybe going to rehab afterwards. But uh, a lot of times, when I if I do a, a single level lumbar fusion surgery, um, uh, I would say a good portion of my patients uh, would go home the following day. Even, um, and uh, ultimately, uh, these patients will have a faster recovery. Uh, and most likely return to normal activities and work uh, sooner. Um, I do want to uh, uh, throw out a caveat though, fusion rate um, is the same if, you know, if it's MIS or traditional open. So when I talk about re uh, faster recovery, I generally mean uh, recovery from, uh, from the, uh, the wound healing uh, and, and also the uh, post-op soreness. Um, 
And uh, that's, that's a patient benefit. But if you look at the uh, overall economic benefit uh, to the hospital, to uh, society, uh, all these factors from the left also translates to a uh, greater benefit for um, our institution, for society, for, uh, you know, that just, uh, you know, it's great for everybody. Um, so less blood loss means uh, uh, no, no need for uh, intraoperative cell saver, which collects your blood and then spins it down and, and then uh, we could transfuse it uh, during the surgery. Uh, uh, fewer transfusions post-op. In fact, I uh, I can't really remember the last time I had to transfuse uh, a patient during or after one of these uh, minimally invasive spine surgeries. Uh, lower infection rates means uh, lower rates of readmission, uh, reoperation. Uh, less post-op pain means lower uh, amounts of narcotics that are needed. Um, and of course, there's uh, there's a big problem with uh, narcotic usage uh, currently. And, um, and uh, this uh, hopefully can, can uh, minimize that. Uh, shorter hospital stays uh, means less chance for uh, uh, acquiring hospital uh, uh, complications like, uh, like blood clots in your legs or, uh, or pneumonia infection. And of course, faster recovery, meaning uh, returning back to work faster, um, it has uh, ob obvious uh, societal benefit as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, MIS surgery is not appropriate for all types of surgeries, uh, but as it continues to evolve, uh, we can certainly do um, uh, a lot more MIS techniques um, and expand its uh, usage over time. Um, one way of looking at it is, is by uh, comparing it uh, to traditional surgery in terms of um, invasiveness and, and the level of complexity. Um, I uh, borrowed this slide from my, um, my fellowship mentor, Dr. Uh, Roger Hartle, but I think this is a great graphic because um, on one end of the uh, graph over here on the left side, you have probably uh, the uh, least uh, complicated uh, surgery that could be done. And the, the benefit, the difference between traditional open surgery and, and MIS surgery is really not that great. But as we start to um, uh, go up in, in complexity, um, we could see that uh, traditional surgery, the invasiveness uh, goes up, where the invasiveness of uh, MIS uh, stays low. And uh, assuming that the outcomes are uh, equivalent, you know, this, this area between the two um, curves would be the benefit zone for MIS. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, jargon here, uh, MIS T-lift, MIS L-lift, uh, you know, all these. And uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, uh, inundate you with all these terms, but they just refer to um, the, uh, uh, the way that we approach the spine. So uh, A-lift, you think anterior, that's from the front, P-lift from the, from the back, uh, T-lift off kind of uh, on the side, from the side a little bit through the uh, foramen, um, and uh, L-lift, which is a lateral approach. So in any case, uh, I don't want to uh, um, overburden you with this, but, um, but let's say we start at this end of the curve here, uh, all the way to the least complex. Uh, so for example, in doing uh, lumbar microdiscectomies, uh, well, this is a uh, MIS approach, um, and uh, this is uh, through a tubular retractor here. Um, I know I kind of scoffed at surgeons who uh, claim to be MIS surgeons if they do uh, just this procedure, uh, MIS microdiscectomy through a tube, but really it's, it's, a, it's a bread and butter for uh, many of us uh, MIS surgeons, so a big portion of my caseload uh, is basically microdiscectomy done this way. Um, and, uh, but comparing that to uh, the right, um, you know, as we expand uh, our technique and um, uh, understanding of how we can do this, uh, we could do even um, more extensive decompressions through a tube uh, 
So for example, doing a full laminectomy where we could decompress across the top of the, uh, across the top of the dura uh, and decompressing all the way to the uh, medial joint on, on the other side. Uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Roger Hartle uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, that's one of his expertise and I, I de definitely learned that from him. Um, and uh, comparing that to an open, uh, 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 open surgery where you have to do a midline, a long midline incision and retract the muscle aside and then remove all this uh, midline supporting structure that we really don't need to remove uh, in order to get the job done. So, you know, what's removed? The, uh, the spinous processes and also the uh, ligaments that connect the uh, spinous processes in between. Not to mention you're stripping away all that muscle that was previously uh, attached to the uh, spine. So that's what I mean, uh, you know, when I talk about um, getting, uh, having the same goal as, as traditional uh, open surgery, but without uh, having all this collateral damage um, to the surrounding tissue. So, um, you know, the, the lumbar microdiscectomies are fairly uh, straightforward once, once you get the, the hang of it. Um, but as we start to get uh, more experience with, with doing that surgery, then we can apply it to more difficult surgeries like uh, doing a microdisc uh, from, uh, from the back of the, the neck. Uh, so uh, for example, in this, in this illustration here, this uh, patient came to me, he was a young, young guy uh, with left arm pain and weakness. And uh, he had this uh, fairly large disc herniation right here um, that was pressing on the exiting nerve that was going down his left arm. So there, there are many options you could do. You could uh, try to do uh, this surgery and, and tackle this problem. You could come, come in from the front and remove the entire disc, remove that disc fragment. And then, uh, but because you're removing the disc, you have to put something in its place. You do either a fusion by putting an implant between the vertebrae, or you could do an artificial disc. Um, I do both of those surgeries. I think that's a fairly uh, acceptable, reasonable um, option for this gentleman. Um, but uh, he's a young guy. And so I want to give him the uh, smallest, uh, the minimally, uh, most minimally invasive procedure I could think of. Uh, so I decided to go from the back uh, through a tube. Uh, now you could also do a traditional open where you, again, strip away the muscle and do a laminectomy and uh, remove the disc herniation, you could do that. Uh, but then you might have to think about putting in screws uh, uh, to prevent the cervical spine from uh, kyphosing over over time. But I think uh, doing this uh, MIS approach, um, uh, hopefully that would um, avoid that issue. So here's uh, the intro, an intraoperative picture of this gentleman um, position. And this is the incision that, that I planned. Uh, so no more than maybe an inch and a half uh, incision, uh, slightly bigger maybe. Um, but uh, the dotted line here, that shows the midline and that's probably the length of the um, midline incision I would have to make in order to do this open. Um, but here you can see, this is after I put the, the uh, tube down, the port, and the diameter of the port is uh, 18 millimeters, so slightly bigger than, uh, uh, than uh, half an inch. So fairly small. And um, th through the uh, microscope, uh, I, I was able to take some pictures. This is after I uh, cleared off some muscle, and you can see the, uh, what's called a lamina, um, the, uh, the bone in, in the back. They're kind of like the shingles in the back of the spine. Um, and uh, after I removed the lamina, you can see the, uh, the spinal cord, actually the covering of the spinal cord. Uh, and then uh, you can carefully then find that uh, disc herniation here and uh, tease it out and you get this uh, two centimeter uh, fragment. So fairly big fragment. Um, and uh, he did very well post-op. And as, uh, as you become more proficient with uh, using a tube uh, and microsurgery, uh, you could then uh, do even more difficult surgeries like uh, taking a tumor out of the, uh, of the uh, spinal canal. Uh, so th this, uh, this gentleman here uh, came to me and he had some uh, um, hand pain 
and uh, turns out on MRI, he has this really big intradural uh, tumor here, most likely benign, uh, but it's still big. And here on the cross section, you can see this big uh, tumor here. Here's a spinal cord. Uh, push all the way up against the other side uh, and compressing the spinal cord. So to do the surgery, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging surgery, even if you were to do it uh, in a traditional open way. But because of the benefits of MIS and, and my experience of doing this uh, surgery through a tube, I uh, decided uh, I was going to offer him uh, to do this uh, through, through tubular retractor. And uh, that's exactly what I did. Um, I used a 21 millimeter uh, diameter tube. So about a little bit less than an inch uh, in diameter. Uh, here's the bone, the lamina. And after I removed the, uh, the lamina, uh, here's the uh, covering of the spinal cord. And uh, after I open up the covering of the spinal cord, I immediately see this uh, big fleshy uh, tumor. Um, and just uh, very carefully, slowly, uh, you could uh, use an ultrasonic aspirator and just uh, kind of uh, 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 just make it smaller, progressively smaller, uh, until you finally could uh, safely tease it away from the uh, neural structures uh, and then remove it entirely. And then you can see here's the spinal cord, and here's one of the thoracic nerves coming out. Uh, of course, I close the dura. Uh, which is also uh, technically very difficult to do too, but it can be done with uh, the proper instruments. Uh, but here's the uh, post-op MRI, and as you can see, uh, it's all gone. Gross total resection. Uh, the spinal cord has re-expanded and, and has um, uh, now uh, came back to position in the center. Uh, there's a little bit of post-op fluid here, which could be a mix of uh, uh, CSF uh, and maybe seroma, but uh, that's another benefit of, uh, of MIS surgery is that uh, because we're not removing a lot of bone uh, here, uh, you know, we do have to get in, but you know, this is the extent of the, uh, of the uh, exposure. Um, that means there's smaller potential space for CSF to, uh, to leak out uh, into, the, uh, into the space here. Um, and we could uh, do other fancy things through tube, like putting in uh, implants into the, uh, into the disc space for fusion. Uh, for example, this uh, picture here on the left uh, shows what's called an MIS T-lift, uh, a transforaminal uh, lumbar and body fusion. So we go through the, uh, the uh, neural foramen to do the surgery. Um, and it's uh, com in comparison, uh, traditional open surgery, you can see that, uh, again, uh, a wide exposure is needed, stripping away the muscle, removing a lot of bone in the middle, and retracting the dura over uh, to put the implant in. Uh, now, I'll be fair, this is not exactly, this is not a T-lift, this is a, a PLIF, uh, which does require uh, retraction of the dura, uh, but open surgeons can, can also do a T-lift uh, through this way as well, but it still requires all this. Uh, exposure and uh, removal of bony structures. So um, one example that, uh, that I did uh, before coming here um, was this lady that uh, she's a banker. She uh, had a tough time sitting at her job all day and standing, walking. Uh, she had a lot of back pain and leg pain. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, there's a, a high degree of, uh, of uh, malalignment. Uh, of L4-5, and uh, because it's translated over, she's got stenosis in the canal and compression of the nerves. Well, I did the, um, the that uh, uh, T-lip surgery through a tube. Uh, here's that implant that I put in, in, in between the vertebrae and locked it in place with these screws. Um, and she did great. She, she wrote an online review um, that uh, three weeks uh, after surgery, she had no pain. and She was able to stand up straight um, and walk taller. So um, that is one of the um, uh, greatest gratifications when a patient uh, could come out of it um, and, uh, and write something like this. Um, it was very satisfying. Um, and uh, so, uh, so be, the image before, uh, I showed uh, the screws uh, uh, that help with uh, holding that, that construct in place. 
uh, well, that's uh, that's another thing that um, that is done through MIS approach. Um, so a lot of times we use these screws and rods to, to help with uh, support with the fusion process. Uh, in some cases, uh, we also use screws and rods to help correct abnormal curvatures or alignments in the spine, uh, as that previous case showed. Um, and the ways that the screws are placed uh, are also very different between the traditional way and the uh, MIS way. So uh, if you look at the traditional way, again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, wide muscle dissection, retraction, and then just to get uh, to trajectory to put that uh, those pedicle screws in. Uh, well, in the uh, minimally invasive approach, uh, the screws are basically placed through uh, a, the tissue in a direct path through the muscle in a uh, kind of a muscle splitting technique instead of uh, muscle dissection. Um, and how how are these screws different compared to traditional screws that allow us to do that? Well. For one thing, these screws are cannulated, which means that they have these uh, uh, a very uh, small uh, hole in the middle, uh, this channel that allows us to put um, a K wire uh, into the bone first, and then we put the screw uh, over the K wire and into the bone. The other thing is um, these screws have these long uh, towers or tabs that protrude above the skin. And uh, what that allows us to do is to uh, feed a rod uh, all the way down uh, into the screw tulip and feed it uh, from uh, one screw to another, uh, linking all the screws, um, and and then uh, and then uh, uh, fixing them down with uh, set screws. Uh, so that's that's one way that the instruments are different, but the way that they're placed are also different. In that when you're doing this from a traditional open technique. Uh, a lot of it is, is uh, visual anatomy. So you're, you're exposing the spine, you can see the anatomic landmarks. And a lot of times uh, the surgeons will use uh, maybe one uh, C-arm x-ray to help with, with guidance. But um, a lot of times the, uh, the surgeon will do it freehand uh, uh, just by, uh, by visualization. But in MIS, we're relying uh, mainly on, um, on fluoroscopy and, and I'll talk about a little bit more later, navigation, because we're not exposing any of the spine. And so this, we have to rely on uh, other technologies to help guide us in screw placement. And uh, here's, here's another example uh, of a case where I uh, see the screw towers, uh, or, uh, the screws are placed with the screw towers. And then I feed the rod um, through each screw tower all the way down, um, passing all the screw heads and then locking down set screws and then I remove the tabs. Um, this case also illustrates uh, something else that's MIS. Uh, the, the implants in between the vertebrae here and here, uh, they're different from the MIS T-lip implants that I showed you earlier. Um, these are what's called um, lateral inner body fusion uh, implants uh, or um, uh, the implants that uh, we put in through L-lift or X-lift, maybe you've heard of that. Um, but uh, why is it considered MIS? Well, uh, remember the, the goal, the object of MIS surgery is to minimize as much surrounding tissue disruption as possible. Well, uh, lateral surgery does this by uh, using a small incision. You can see how small the incision is. Um, and using a, a small uh, port um, or small retractors, uh, I go through uh, a few thin layers of uh, muscle uh, along the flank area, uh, go into the retroperitoneal space, and then um, again, the muscle splitting technique uh, past the psoas muscle or the muscle that runs along each side of the spine. Um, and then I get to the disc space that way. Um, and then I'm able to clear out a, a, a Good portion of the disc space and put in this implant. Um, well, what's the advantage of doing a lateral surgery? Uh, well, you're looking at the implant right here. It's, it's the ability of putting in um, an implant that has a really big footprint that allows for a very high fusion rate, but also uh, allows the surgeon to do some major correction of the spine as well. Um, so, for example, uh, this patient here that I had. Uh, she had very severe back pain and leg pain, uh, mainly when she was standing and, and sitting, when she's upright. Uh, well, the MRI didn't look so bad, but the MRI is done with her um, uh, laying down. 
But when you stand her up uh, on the x-ray, you can see how uh, these two levels are uh, malaligned. They're shifted out of position. And uh, that's what we call uh, 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 spinal anesthesis and instability. So um, the way I tackled it was uh, I did a lateral uh, fusion surgery at L45. Uh, and then I, uh, I supported everything with screws and rods. And you can see how robust that implant is in between the vertebrae here and then on, uh, on the front view, you can see how wide that implant is. Basically, it goes from one side of the vertebrae to the other side. Uh, well, one of the limitations of lateral surgery is that it can't be done for L5-S1 level. You can see that this is a different implant here, uh, and you can't do it uh, for that level because you can't, you can't come across the crest, the iliac crest is over here, and also the, uh, the nerve plexus, um, the position of the nerve plexus is unfavorable to going from the side. Um, you could do it obliquely. I, I don't want to get into that right, uh, tonight, but uh, so that segues into another MIS approach, uh, how I put this implant in. And uh, this is uh, done from the front. So an A-lift surgery, um, anterior lumbar and body fusion surgery. And I generally do this with the, uh, in conjunction with the vascular surgeon. Um, and, um, um, and generally, uh, the uh, L5-S1, um, uh, the A-lift surgery is done with the patient uh, supine. Um, but I actually did this uh, in a lateral position. So this is a lateral A-lift procedure. Um, and uh, what it allowed me to do was uh, tackle the L4-5 level from the lateral uh, approach as well. So, uh, so, there was, uh, um, so there was no need to reposition the patient uh, after I did uh, one, one of the levels. Um, and the advantage of uh, doing a, a lateral ALIF is that um, the uh, it recruits gravity as a uh, as another retractor. It's a very powerful retractor, actually. So my vascular surgeon colleague was able to get to the spine with the smallest uh, incision possible. And uh, uh, this vascular surgeon that I worked with for many years in Baltimore is fantastic. Uh, but he wasn't known for his cosmetic uh, incisions. Uh, they when, when we were doing um, these A-lift procedures uh, with the patient laying flat, uh, the incisions would uh, be from here to here. I mean, they were uh, pretty prominent, uh, but even he has been able to shrink it down to this size by using uh, this technique. Uh, although the skill and the technique of doing this is important, the technology available, uh, availability of the technology was also key because uh, this retractor system uh, which allowed us to do it in such a fashion, only came out to the market only uh, a couple of years ago. So um, I don't know, uh, the not, um, not too many surgeons are doing it this way yet, but it's starting to pick up uh, in, in popularity. Um, and so I think you, you uh, probably all notice a trend now in my talk is that um, uh, my point is that MIS surgery is not just one surgery or one skill or technique, but it's a complement of, of tools and techniques that can be put together in such a way to get the best possible results uh, with the smallest exposures possible. Uh, and then uh, when you're combining them, um, uh, that's basically allowed us to shift uh, to the right of the, that um, graph that I was uh, uh, showing you earlier in terms of what kind of surgeries we do. We could do a lot more complex surgeries and even uh, even fairly traumatic uh, deformity correction surgeries, such as this patient that I did um, uh, with the multi-level uh, construct to uh, really get her uh, spine straight. Um, and uh, as I was mentioning uh, before, the way, the way that the MIS screws are placed, it relies heavily on imaging. And uh, the way that I've been doing this for many years is uh, using C-arm fluoroscopy. Um, and typically I would use uh, two C-arms at the same time in a biplanar fashion. So one looking at the lateral and the other one looking at AP. Um, and I still use this technique in, in certain instances, um, and I'm very comfortable with that. But over the last several years, there's been a, uh, an explosion of, um, of spinal navigation. 
okay? What's spinal navigation? Well, it's, it's basically like a GPS system for the spine. Uh, and at Brooklyn Methodist, uh, as part of my recruitment, uh, they purchased this uh, very fancy and expensive uh, navigation equipment here, <coughs> actually the same exact model. And uh, uh, it, it looks like a C-arm, but it, it spins around and uh, takes multiple images and then reconstructs it uh, in a three-dimensional image of the spine, almost in a CT quality. And it's uploaded onto the workstation here. And, and there's a special pointer that, that I use uh, that is read by this uh, camera. And basically anywhere I touch on the patient uh, that I scanned, um, I can see exactly where I am and what path is going to take on the, uh, on the screen, on the navigation screen. Um, the tracking can also be put not only on a pointer, but on instruments as well. So for example, uh, the tools that we use to insert screws, they could also be seen by this camera. And so we could use that image on the screen to plan and, and guide screw placement and trajectory. Um, it's, it really is quite remarkable. So this is a picture uh, depicting a trajectory of a typical pedicle screw placement. Um, but the, the other uh, way that I've been using the navigation, it's not just strictly for putting in implants for me. It's also with uh, doing decompressions. And, and uh, uh, please ignore, I, I, uh, forgive me for the reflections on, on the uh, workstation screen. I, I had amateur photographers uh, that day. But uh, in any case, in, in this case here, uh, this, this lady uh, came in with uh, really severe leg pain, um, uh, basically from this uh, disc fragment here that was extruded uh, out into the foramen, into the neural foramen. And you can see that nerve is pushed up against the, the pedicle here, against this bone. And that's where she was getting all that uh, nerve pain, and pain down her leg. So what I uh, did for her was that I uh, uh, used tubular uh, surgery, uh, tubular decompression to uh, make a little hole through the, uh, the bone and the joint uh, and to tease out that disc fragment. Uh, well, <clears throat> using navigation, that really allowed me to hone in on exact, exactly where I need to go on the skin. So it made, allowed me to make a very precise incision, uh, no smaller, no bigger than what I needed. And, uh, and as I uh, exposed down, I put the tube in, uh, did a little bit of uh, 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 muscle um, clearing off the bone here and put the pointer. I knew exactly where I was. I knew exactly that my trajectory was going to lead me uh, to where I wanted to be. So, uh, and as I drilled deeper into the bone, I <clears throat> uh, took the pointer and I put it in where I was uh, just to make sure that I was on the right track, that I wasn't. Uh, uh, headed uh, for some uh, exit off the Bell Park like when I didn't want to get off. Uh, so it, it's exactly where I want to go. And then um, finally, uh, once I've uh, gotten all the way into that neural frame and I double checked that I was in that right, uh, exactly where I needed to be, uh, right where that disc herniation is. And intraoperatively, this is through a microscope and uh, unfortunately it was just not focused for the screen. But um, here's that little um, opening that I drilled through the hole, through, through the bone. And you can see it's a very small opening, just enough to get my suction and uh, some small instruments in. And here's the um, bottom edge of the nerve. Okay, it's being displaced upwards. This is uh, towards the head. It was being displaced upwards by this disc fragment. And as I tease this out, this disc fragment, uh, afterwards, you can see the, the nerve kind of bounced back in place and became rounded and decompressed. Uh, of course, the lady felt way better. <laughs> so, um, and then just for, just for uh, safekeeping, I uh, double checked that I got everything out and put the pointer down to uh, all the way at the bottom and there's just uh, nowhere else to go. So uh, the car was in the garage, as they would say. Um, and uh, looking forward uh, to how we could uh, use navigation with everything else. 
Uh, more recently, we're working on uh, augmented reality uh, to help us uh, with, with surgery. And uh, this takes a combination of navigation and, and some sophisticated software in the microscope to overlay anatomic structures uh, through the eyepiece. So we don't have to keep looking away from the microscope and looking at the screen. Um, all the structures, underlying structures, were, are, are basically in graphic uh, right in front of us in, uh, in graphic representation. So it's really neat. Uh, and Dr. Roger Hartle's uh, working on it right now. And, uh, um, and there's uh, opportunity for us to do it here at Brooklyn Methodist as well. So this is very exciting to be part of that um, innovation. Um, now, lastly, uh, you may have heard about robotics and spine surgery. Maybe you have, maybe you have it. But, uh, or even you've been seduced by maybe going to a hospital that boasts about uh, using robots for spine surgery. Uh, you may even imagine a character such as uh, this guy from Star Wars uh, or something sophisticated like uh, the Da Vinci robot that they use for abdominal, gynecological, and neurologic uh, surgeries. Uh, but in reality, uh, robotic spine surgery is at its infancy, and, and we're, we're just not there yet. Um, a better term for it may be robotic-assisted spine surgery. Uh, and here are just a couple of examples. This is, a, a, this is a, an arm that's uh, put out by um, one of the navigation uh, companies. Uh, and this is, uh, this is another robotic arm uh, that's uh, put out by a device company. Um, and what they all have in common is that they're integrated uh, with a navigation system, and they all have multiple points of articulation. Um, and where we right now is that uh, it basically holds the instrument in place for you, for the surgeon to do drilling and screw placement. And that's about it. So it's just another arm to hold the instrument for you. <laughs> so uh, although it's it's fairly exciting that we're thinking ahead, looking at robotics for spine surgery, and it has potential. Uh, I personally am waiting for version 2.0, maybe even version 3.0, uh, before uh, uh, investing in something like this. So um, that's all I have to say. I want to end a little bit early in case anybody has questions. Great, Lewis. Thank you so much uh, for going through all of that. We do have some questions, which I'll uh, go through. Um, I just want to reiterate to everyone that we can't uh, answer individual medical questions accurately in this setting. So um, if you do want specific information about your particular uh, situation, feel free to call Dr. Chegg's office and he can uh, meet with you either in person or via a video visit. Um, and so to get started, um, the, one of the questions was, how would you treat a symptomatic Tarlov cyst? Um, and, you know, as a correlate, corollary, um, are MIS approaches uh, suitable for that? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. Um, um, you know, I would say that the majority of Tarlov cysts are, uh, are not symptomatic, and uh, a lot of them don't need to be surgically treated. Uh, but if you want the, uh, the least invasive way of treating it, um, uh, they can be treated um, by an interventional radiologist, actually. So I know there's a, there's a, a guy up at uh, Cornell uh, main campus who, who does that. So that's probably my first step. If, it, if uh, after uh, a full workup, um, we, we uh, figure that this is where your symptoms are coming from and you want uh, the least invasive method of treating this possible, um, I would probably um, look at that avenue first before doing any kind of uh, surgery for that. Next question is, in general, how long is the recovery after an MIS microdiscectomy? Yeah, so it's, it's variable uh, by, by a patient, but in general, um, a microdiscectomy, lumbar microdiscectomy procedure is done as an outpatient basis. So, a lot of my patients, uh, if I do it early in the morning or before uh, lunchtime, many of them would uh, actually go home the same day once they recover from anesthesia. Um, and uh, they typically, they're gonna have some surgical site soreness and pain. That's, that 
you know, that we can't get to zero, but it's uh, generally tolerable. Um, and uh, most people are able to uh, go home and uh, maybe rest for a couple of days, but I do encourage patients to get up and walk a, a, as much as possible. And maybe even do simple chores, just, uh, you know, maybe doing some dishes, but avoid any bending, uh, twisting, heavy lifting, things like that. Um, and generally, when I see them back in my office for a wound check uh, three weeks after surgery, um, their pain has subsided substantially. Um, it takes the wound uh, maybe about four to six weeks for it to, to heal um, to a point where uh, I'm not so worried about it anymore and patients could take baths uh, if they needed to. Um, but uh, about uh, six weeks out, I would say that they're uh, nearly uh, back to normal in terms of functioning. Uh, and three months out, that's basically they're, they're done unless they still have issues. Um, most of my patients are completely recovered by that. And I think it's important to note that people are often back to work well before the six, six weeks mark after a micro Right. right. Uh, sometimes right. within a few days. Um, yeah. Really, the re restrictions yeah. after a micro disc are mostly from the standpoint of uh, heavy physical activity or exertion. Would you agree with that, Louis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it all depends. And we um, you know, talk to patients all the time about uh, what, what occupation they're in and, and we kind of decide, um, even before surgery, what the expectations are in terms of when they could go back to work and whether they could uh, maybe even go back on a part-time or light duty basis. I think it's also important to note, even though this was a talk about minimally invasive spine surgery, it's really important as a patient that um, you understand that you really want to be seen at a comprehensive spine center because surgery is often or really is the last resort. And uh, when other conservative measures such as medication or physical therapy have failed. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing to mention uh, for any patients uh, suffering with back pain or uh, spine related disorders. Um, the next question is, um, can the small incision see the area appropriately um, so that you can do the surgery uh, effectively? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is this, are the small incisions of MIS sufficient to be able to see what you need to see when you're doing the operation? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, that's, uh, but that's the beauty of this uh, is that um, but the, you know, MIS surgery is, I think is, it's difficult for um, uh, maybe a lot of uh, traditional spine surgeons that are just starting to do this because they feel like they need to see everything in order to do what they need to do. You know, they don't feel comfortable uh, just seeing a small portion of the anatomy. And, um, and I think that's, um, that, was, that was one of the major challenges. And that's, that's why there's like a big learning curve initially is because you have, to kind of, you have to know the anatomy from microsurgical technique. So you're kind of, uh, you, you're much more honed in on a small portion of the spine. And uh, you know, with experience with, uh, with navigation even, um, yeah, I mean, you know, these small incisions are, are um, more than adequate to do what you need to do. And the other thing that, uh, you know, something that uh, Dr. Hartle uh, uh, really showed me and, uh, and uh, a lot of spine sur uh, MIS surgeons do is that, uh, you know, these tubes aren't fixed in, in a, a locked position. I mean, they're, they're locked in once you wanna, uh, you, know, uh, do, you know, when you're working, but then you could unlock the, the hinges and move it uh, and wand it around in any um, direction you want. So you could get different uh, angles, uh, uh, you know, looking at the spine. So that's why even with a small incision, you could do a very, uh, very robust decompression just by moving the tube around in, in different uh, planes and in, in different uh, trajectories. That's great. Um, another question I'll just answer quickly, you know, can MIS treat epidural lipomatosis? Um, the answer is yes, but typically the first um, uh, mechanism of treating that is either weight loss or discontinuation of steroid treatment. But if you need surgery because those things aren't 
possible, uh, then of course MIS can help. Um, do you have anything to add in terms of epidermal epidural lipomatosis treatment? No, I, I think you I think you uh, answered it perfectly well. Yeah. I the next question is um, from a patient who has multi-level uh, spondylosis of the spine and has been told she needs a fusion uh, from L3 to L5. Can MIS uh, address this sort of um, uh, issue? And I think obviously without seeing your images, we can't uh, uh, opine specifically, but the answer is often yes. Yeah. in that uh, MIS approaches can address many of these issues right. um, without uh, resorting to open surgery. You might still need a fusion, but um, you know, the MIS approach can save you a lot of um, you know, recovery time and, and pain, right. as uh, Dr. Chang mentioned. Yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, what is the success rate for MIS that's being shown? Uh, well, that's a, that's a broad question. I mean, uh, I think you have to look at it uh, from uh, different, different uh, angles. So in the literature, people have been, com what people do is that they, we compare um, the results of MIS surgery with traditional outcome, uh, uh, outcomes from traditional spine surgery. And depending on what you're using it for, there are papers out there regarding uh, trauma, uh, using MIS uh, techniques for trauma, for, uh, for tumors, uh, malignancies, for uh, spinal, uh, spinalosis, degeneration. I mean, you have a, a gamut of, of different applications. Um, and in general, yes, uh, they all show uh, very, um, very close uh, uh, outcome in terms of uh, success rate with, uh, uh, with traditional surgery in terms of uh, a clinical outcome, fusion, rate of fusion, um, and oftentimes what we, when we uh, look at these papers or when we uh, publish uh, literature uh, data, we also look at um, OR time and blood loss, uh, use of uh, post-op narcotics. These are also other, um, other uh, measures that we use uh, to compare the two different types of surgeries. And uh, many cases, uh, MIS surgery wins uh, in those categories. The other thing to add is that success, you know, we enter every operation with, the, with you know, the expectation and goal of a successful outcome. And the way you can, you know, help make sure of that is that as a surgeon, you pick the right patients for surgery. And that means knowing when surgery is going to help and when surgery is not going to help. Right. And so um, that's why we at Cornell uh, really focus when we're hiring our faculty on picking those people who are not just uh, technically uh, excellent at, at their craft, but also, uh, you know, have excellent judgment as it pertains to uh, when and how to do an operation. Right. Um, another question is, um, we're almost out of time, but I think we can get through the rest of these. Um, can a patient have an allergic reaction to the screws or rods? Uh, that's that's really rare these days. Uh, you know, we we uh, we've gone away from using um, uh, um, um, stainless steel or you know things like that. I mean, titanium is uh, extremely rare, um, uh, and I, I have not encountered any of that. So. Um. The next question was, uh, what consideration is given to loss of range and uh, loss of range of motion, um, and how accurately you can predict this? I think, um, you know, it really depends on. Uh, it's a complicated question to answer in a one-off. I think it depends on where the fusion is, how old you are, yeah. how much range of motion you had before the surgery, and what. Um, levels are being fused, um, those are all going to affect what we call adjacent level issues yeah. um, after a fusion. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think what Lewis would say, and Lewis, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when we plan a surgery, we plan it in such a way that we, we try and, you know, really take care to minimize the effect on adjacent segments um, so that people don't develop uh, future adjacent segment disease. Yeah, that, that's correct. And a lot of it is, uh, is pre-planning because 
uh, the last thing you want to do is uh, lock someone in or fuse someone into uh, a uh, spinal curvature or alignment that puts stress on the level that's not fused. Uh, so that's that's very important. And uh, um, the other thing I will say is that, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you, you said. It's really hard to uh, put everything in a basket. But uh, there, there are cases where um, you know, a, a patient will have a fusion uh, and they actually feel like, they have better range of motion after surgery. And that's mainly because uh, they don't have the same degree of pre-op back pain that they had um, after, you know, once they've recovered from that surgery. But. Um, someone asked how to do a televisit. You could call either number as listed as on Lewis, Dr. Chang's uh, last slide. Um, and if you Google him, any number that's listed in his website will uh, be sufficient. Um, have you ever done an MIS procedure and been surprised once you opened up, uh, once you, uh, exposed the spine? Uh, surprised, uh, it, it's not more specific than that, but just surprised, I guess. <laughs> not, not, not really. I mean, I, I don't like surprises. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I do everything. So I'm, I'm kind of boring actually. Uh, I, get all the scans that I need to get beforehand. Um, some, sometimes uh, patients might feel annoyed that, you know, they come with an MRI and they're seeing for uh, CAT scans and scoliosis x-rays and flexion extension, flexion extension x-rays and all these things. Uh, and that's because I don't want to be surprised uh, when I get in there. So yeah, it's all, uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of pre-planning. Yeah. Um, one was about the lipomatosis. Yes, the, lip the actual fat can be removed during the procedure um, in addition to doing the bone removal. And then the last question was, do we have any female spinal surgeons in our department? We have a number of female neurosurgeons in our department, but in terms of um, our spine group in particular, we have uh, female spine pain management and neurologists, et cetera. But um, to your point, we don't currently have a female specific spinal surgeon, uh, though, as I mentioned before, department has a number of female neurosurgeons. Uh, but uh, that's something, obviously, as our department grows, we'll be looking to uh, expand. All right, so I think we went through everyone's questions. Um, certainly send us an email with any quest other questions that might come up. You have our contact information. I hope this was useful to everyone. And, um, you know, uh, we have a number of other uh, webinars coming up. Um, so please check uh, your email uh, for those dates. Uh, the next uh, webinars will focus on uh, stroke care and cerebrovascular care. You know, how we deal as neurosurgeons when patients have strokes, aneurysms, AV fistulas, AVMs, uh, pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, which is another name for that is uh, benign intracranial hypertension. Uh, that'll be the one of the next webinars. And then the following webinar after that, uh, we'll uh, focus on movement disorders like Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, uh, as well as peripheral nerve surgery. And then uh, in 2021, we'll, we'll have uh, some session, a session on pediatric neurosurgery. Um, so really, um, hoping to uh, cover a number of uh, issues uh, for everyone. So I hope this was enjoyable. Uh, and like I said, please email us if there are any questions, concerns, comments you might have. And thank you again to Dr. Chang uh, for his great talk. Yeah, thank you everyone for uh, coming tonight. Take care, good night.